Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Sabina Leonelli, who is Professor of Philosophy and History of Science at the University of Exeter in the UK, where she co-directs the Center for the Study of the Life Sciences. Her research focuses on the methods and assumptions involved in the use of big data for discovery, the challenges involved in the extraction of knowledge from digital infrastructure, and the role of the open science movement within current landscapes of knowledge production. Today we will try to zoom in on the topic of open science, which is very actual in all fields of research, but it's also important for every citizen and society at large. So first of all, welcome to Technoculture, Sabina. Thank you. I first got in touch with your work precisely because of open science. You do many different things, some of which we just mentioned, but when did you develop this interest in open science? Well, I am, uh, my main work is in philosophy of science, so I have a strong interest in the ways in which science is governed, and what does it mean to do research, what are the components of research, what is the epistemology of research, so how actually we get to know what we know, how do we prove it, how people use models, data, etc. And so um, as part of those interests, I focus particularly on the study of data, and in my interest in data, I encountered the increasing discussions around open data and what it means to disseminate and publish data in the first place. And that led me to think a bit more broadly about open science. So I would say I've been involved in discussions around openness and open science since maybe 2012, 2013. We hear a lot about open science today, like with capital letters, OA. It's a thing. It's been promoted very much. Uh, in the scientific community, sometimes I would also say it's being pushed on researchers, like this is the direction where research practices need to go now. And there's much good in this, but it seems like it's a, it's a new thing. It's being talked about now. So I would like to ask you if open science is really something new or maybe it was already there in the past, but it wasn't called open science well, so I think open science is really a subset of a much broader movement, which involves things like open government, open knowledge, around how do we disseminate information. So part of the reason why it's become so popular and so visible these days is the dissemination of technology and the availability of digital technology, ICTs, the internet, and the fact that people are feeling more and more that there are alternative ways of disseminating information than the usual official channels, you know, the typical traditional publishing industry or, you know, formal uh, policy documents, things like that. So partly there is that. And also partly there is a strong um, feeling, I think, particularly among governments, that there are problems in communication, in particular the communication of expertise at this point in time, that there is a lot of mistrust, particularly among you know, uh, developed democracies in the developed world, of government, of expertise, of uh, the credibility, really, of research itself. And so what is needed as an antidote to this increasing mistrust is to make knowledge as open as possible so that people have the feeling that things are transparent and they're not being hidden from them in any way. So, you know, the idea of open science per se, so the idea that you can actually um, freely disseminate and make available the results of research, is very old. I mean, it wasn't called open science, but many communities in the sciences have been operating like this since hundreds of years. I mean, astronomy. It's in the spirit of science. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's a very, very old idea. I mean, one could say, you know, the idea that there is scrutiny over each other's results and all the results of science are laid bare to the world so that people can criticize them if they want. I mean, that's really what makes science science, right? So that's really not a new idea at all. But I think what makes it new or at least attractive as a movement now are these components. On one hand, trying to address the mistrust of the population towards expertise, and on the other, this idea that we need to anyhow rethink communication because of the technological opportunities we have. I think that we've already touched on a very crucial point, and that is trust. Mm 
Open science is about opening up your data and like you just said, transparency, but there is definitely an element of wanting to see your data, also to be sure that you didn't tamper with it, didn't massage it in favor of the hypothesis you wanted to prove. I guess that open science is not about policing your peers and colleagues' job, but there is an element of that built into it, built in the narrative of how it's presented. The will of science to ascertain things, to verify things, to know for sure, is not motivated by mistrust in the beginning. So I'm not saying it's not a good thing to want to check things, but not because there's mistrust. And in the case of opening up uh, the community's data, that shouldn't be, I think, the main motivation. But indeed, I'm aware also of the mistrust uh, that the generic public has for, for science in general. It's done with public money. Sometimes, you know, like in every field, scandals make it to the mainstream media. And there has been a process of eroding, indeed, the respect besides the trust that people have in science. So I think that mistrust here can be intended in two ways. is the mistrust that peers and colleagues have for each other's work and also the mistrust that the generic public has for science as one social collective endeavor that is being funded with public money. Can you tell me when this feeling of mistrust started, how did it come to grow? Well, I mean, so there's two different things here I think that's going on. First of all, there is the fact that um, science certainly over the last 30 years has changed enormously. It's become more and more specialized. More and more people are coming into the field of scientific research around the world. In many nations, there are kind of um, flourishing research programs in a way that wasn't the case, uh, say, 50 years ago. Now, that means that because research keeps being more and more and more specialized, it also becomes more and more tribalized. So you get people that work in fields which are more and more narrow, that are losing the capability to talk to each other because people are adopting very specific terminology, very specific instrumentation to look at very particular parts of the world. In a situation like this, it's quite easy to understand why the general public would feel that actually all this work that's happening in academia and in research is incomprehensible to anybody who doesn't have many, many years of training to understand what's going on. And I think partly it is really a result of how science is being done right now, it's almost unavoidable. On the other end, it's also because there is little incentive really within the scientific world to devote some time towards engaging like other types of people in the work that you do, explaining to the general public what is going on in your research and how that may affect what they do. So, you know, I think there are actually good reasons in contemporary science to think that there is a bit of a gap between how sciences are presented and publicized and understood in general terms in the media and what actually is going on in scientific laboratories and in, in academic environments. So, you know, in that sense, it, I think mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's justified, the fact that there is a growing mistrust. I mean, there's not necessarily a ground for this in, in the sense that people are doing things which are not relevant or credible, but it's just that it's becoming more and more difficult for people who don't have certain kinds of training to assess or in any way um, even just interpret what people are doing who are doing specialized jobs. I struggle with accepting this feeling of mistrust because I personally don't share it, although I might have a special perspective on this because I am a researcher, so I see the processes of science also happening from the inside. Although I would say I have a fundamental trust for colleagues in fields of which I know nothing about, and uh, I will admit, this is something, of course, that uh, cannot be denied, that there is a lot of pressure on researchers today to publish as much as possible. That means that you have to show that you have a lot of results. And not just results, but positive results at that. That means I have a hypothesis and I test it and I need to be proven right. Now, that's a shame because sometimes you're just curious to find something out. And if you're proven wrong, 
as a scientist, I think you should be kind of equally, equally happy because you have learned something new. But we all know that to say I had this fancy hypothesis and it was proven right, that's considered more a success than, of course, a negative result. So I think that with digital technology used to generate, extract, process, store, transfer, share data, uh, which make it fairly easy to tamper with it. And in a few clicks, you can change a parameter in uh, large data sets and still have a clean result to present that, well, if we don't want to live in a naive uh, world, then yes, there will be groups of people who tamper with their data. Precisely because there, I think there is a tendency to want to steer data in your favor. Now that's always been happening probably, but now maybe more so because not only digital technology makes it easier, but because there's more people involved in the community, like you were saying before. So with these two elements combined, the pressure on researchers to produce a lot and the ease to massage your data, then yes, I can imagine that the will to police, peers and colleagues' job becomes a necessity. What I would like you to tell us is something about how much this aspect is relevant within the open science movement. How important is this aspect of policing data in the overall narrative of how transparency and um, access to data is presented? Well, the idea is that um, in order to be able to assess what is going on in science, even for an expert. Ideally, you should have access to as many components of the research process as possible. And that hasn't really been the trend in scientific publishing over the last 30 or 40 years. So people have gotten more and more used to value can, you know, hypotheses more than anything else. So you have an hypothesis in your work. You then go off, you set up a whole research um, experiment to try and prove your hypothesis. You maybe develop a particular software or a particular instrument that allow you to um, produce data and analyze data. You then um, do this analysis, you, you kind of tweak it in lots of different ways. But ultimately, what people are encouraged to publish is only the claims that they get out of this research that they think may be true, and the little bit of data that proves kind of, in a sense, incontrovertibly, that these claims are true. And for a long time, this has become really what we think about when we think about knowledge in general. For a lot of academics, knowledge is whatever is written in a textbook, whatever is written or published in a paper, not all the activities, the process, the protocols, the techniques, the instruments that are actually used to perform those activities. So um, I think... Part of the motivation behind open science is a growing recognition that actually a lot of different types of work goes into doing research, and only small parts of this work is now recognized and rewarded as what really is knowledge. Right? So people who become famous and get Nobel Prizes are typically people who write very theoretical papers that prove an hypothesis. People who set up very complex instruments, people who spend a lot of time curating data so that other people can pick them up and reuse them. These people are not typically rewarded. Sometimes they're not even seen as scientists. But their work, arguably, is actually as important for the production of knowledge as is the work of people who work on hypotheses and theoretical knowledge. So part of the idea behind open science is to make sure that people are valuing and also evaluating and rewarding every part of the whole process that is the scientific process of, of knowledge production. And that means um, actually making more evident and, and managing to document things like how you set up a process, project, how you design it, how you set up instruments, what protocols you're using, what software you're using, however many data you've produced, even if in the end you're only using a certain subset of data to prove whatever your hypothesis uh, you, you, you want to support. So the idea being that, you know, if you manage to document all of this and to make it public, 
first of all, you give people a much better sense of how you've done your research. You make it easier to check its validity. You make it easier, possibly, if relevant, to reproduce it. And at the same time, you also make it possible to pick up some of these other elements of research and reuse them, even for people that maybe are not that interested in the hypothesis, but maybe they're interested in your data or maybe they're interested in your software. I mean, software is an easy example, I think, because a typical case in which you develop an algorithm or a program to analyze a certain kind of data, maybe in cell biology, because you want to be able to check whether a certain set of genetic data is associated to a certain phenotype, a certain trait of the cell. But in fact, it turns out that that particular algorithm you've developed could be applicable to completely different types of data, maybe in musicology, maybe in archaeology, maybe in text mining. And somebody that comes from those fields could look at the software and think about a very different use, just as productive, but in a different field. If that software hasn't been made public because people who developed it thought, well, it's not really relevant. What's really relevant is just our publications at the end. It's not really all the stuff we developed to get there. Well, then you're never going to get that kind of reuse. And so this is really a core motivation for open science. Can you talk a little bit about the problems and limitations that we may encounter when we actually want to implement this very good concept for which you've made a great case, that is opening up data? I imagine copyright issues or, to begin with, the fact that it's very time-consuming to curate the data before you share it. Yeah, so um, it is indeed extremely difficult to open data. I mean, and anybody who's ever tried to do that knows it. Partly because um, what you don't want is to simply dump your data somewhere. You know, this typical problem of the data dumps, that you create these archives which are not organized, it's very difficult to find data of relevance in there or to retrieve them in any way. I mean, to, to make data public in that way, it's almost as if it's equivalent to not making them public because if there is no structured way to look for your data and organize them, then they really are not usable to anybody. So it is true that curating the data is absolutely essential. Now, I mean, I would be actually the first to say that I don't think... Um, opening up all data is really necessarily what we really aim for here. I mean, because, because precisely because um, it's, so, it's so time consuming and so laborious to uh, put data online, what people really need to think about is, okay, so which data are really precious here? How do we choose which data we prioritize in this exercise? So, you know, if you're looking at simulation data, for instance, well, maybe these are not a big priority because at that point it's better to make your software available online rather than the data themselves. They're less relevant. If you're thinking about very specialized and very laboriously produced experimental data on a unique sample, well, those may be exactly the data that you want to be able to put online because they're very, very difficult, in fact, to reproduce, and that makes them precious as a resource that somebody else may want to access and reevaluate. So that is, is just a beginning consideration. But I think um, the biggest battle really at this point in the whole field of open data and more generally open science is about actually a, the, the battle of rewards and incentives. So in that sense, a lot of the work also I've done with the European Commission on Open Science is about the rewards that are attached to working openly in research. Because at this point in time, really, there is basically no reward. So anybody who works in academia has to get promoted and hired and basically make a living out of that job. Well, the criteria on which people are evaluated are very often nothing to do with open science behavior. All that many governments do or many universities is to look at your impact factor, look at how, in which prestigious journals you're published and how many papers you've published, and that's how they decide who to hire. Obviously, this is completely contrary to try and incentivate a behavior where you actually do spend time taking care of your data. You do spend time putting them online because these activities don't really lead to any publication necessarily, not in this traditional sense. So the first step towards trying and implement open data in any meaningful sense is basically to get rid of impact factors as a way to evaluate researchers. Because as long as that is in place, 
there's nowhere really for open science to go. I have tried to engage with open science myself, especially with the Marie Curie project that I'm doing now. I wanted to be transparent. That means, of course, that I try to publish open access, but also that I thought how I could open my data up. And you know what was interesting in the beginning? That asking myself the very question, what is my data, was, was not obvious, was not easy to answer. I think that it's a very good thing if uh, new generations of scientists are trained from the beginning, you know, in the mindset of open science, because there are some questions that come with it that I find uh, positively stimulating. For example, what are my data? How should I curate them? Provide them that I have the time and resources to curate them. How should I do that? to make them the most readable and useful to other people who might access them. And I blamed this uh, hard time I had in the beginning on the research field, because there are other research fields uh, that are not my own. So I might be wrong here, and that's my question for you, because I know you have a background in biology, and I would imagine that biology and the medical field in, in general has it easier because practices are more standardized. Whereas, you know, in the digital humanities where I work, it's really not clear. Nobody does exactly what I do. And so it's hard to structure my data and decide what data to share, etc. Would you say that biology is one of those fields where we observe more engagement with open access because of this, because it's easier to? And I don't mean easy. I mean easier than other fields. Well, I'm personally attracted to fields where that's absolutely not the case. And I would take biology to be a very, very good example of a field where there's no agreement whatsoever on standards, on methods, on techniques, even on what counts as data very often changes, even within the same subfield. And what interests me is the fact that there's a very good reason for this. And the reason for this is that the work that people do in different parts of biology, as in environmental science, as in biomedicine, is very specifically tailored to the particular object of the research. So somebody who studies salamanders will not necessarily be using the same methods, the same tools, or even the same types of data as somebody who studies worms or somebody who studies gorillas. It, this will have to vary because your methods will be more and more tailored and adequate to what you're actually looking at in the world. So in biology, this, you know, the fact that these methods have been pursued over hundreds of years has created a situation where almost every tiny little group uses slightly different measures, slightly different criteria. And of course, that makes it very difficult to share the data and to reinterpret them, because everybody has different points of view. So even two people studying gorillas, but independently, will produce different data sets? It's very likely, because they probably would study in different locations, they would have slightly different theoretical perspectives, they would use different presuppositions. I mean, of course, it depends on the field, but there tends to be a very, very little standardization in the ways in which biologists work. There is something that I have learned in my experience with open science so far, not just opening up my data, but also trying to access somebody else's data for my own research. And that is, irrespective of how well-meaning the individual researcher can be, in order to achieve long-term structural change, there needs to be a clear decision at policy level, which needs to translate to platforms and even a reward system like you were saying before. I know that you have conducted a study where you have actually interviewed many scientists across the world and asked them how they feel about open science, how far they are in complying with these new guidelines. What have you learned from that study? I've spent a lot of time arguing back against uh, people who work in university management or even in politicians who think that researchers are very resistant to open science. They hate it. We have to impose it on researchers. I really don't think that's the case, partly because the history of many, many fields in research for centuries has been one of open science. So I think it's kind of ridiculous to think that open science is a, is a political invention that is now being imposed on research. What I, however, also think is very problematic 
is the fact that because of the incentives we just talked about, um, researchers really have a tendency of closing down more and more. And in fact, people who behave in an open science way are punished in the current way of doing research. And so that is what creates the confusion and the, you know, the tensions that a lot of researchers feel when they think about open science. So we did indeed um, a lot of in-depth interviews with researchers both in the UK and um, in Europe and in the States um, and in parts of Africa around their perception of openness, what they associated with that word, what they think about open science, if they have heard of it, um, these kinds of things. And generally, um, the message was that everybody was very um, attracted to open science as an idea. They all wished that they actually could behave in such a way and that there were incentives towards that. But they all pretty much recognized that there were big obstacles in their way and um, that it was really not easy for them given their own institution and their own jobs and their responsibilities, also towards other people in their group to implement these behaviors. For instance, a lot of um, PIs, a lot of heads of labs, told us that they would love to be able to only publish in open access journals. But these are often not necessarily the ones that give you the highest impact factors. They are senior people that don't necessarily care too much about this but they're worried that the postdocs and the PhD students that publish with them would lose out if they decide to only publish in open access journals because these journals are not as rec well recognized as journals which are uh, proprietary, which are closed to the public, but actually have a higher impact factor. So things like this are really what's on the mind of researchers. One other thing that causes a lot of confusion is um, the intersection between open science and intellectual property rights. So um, this is partly because researchers typically are parts of lots and lots and lots of different networks all at the same time. So on one end, of course, they work in one or two institutions. And so you would think that they would just have to follow the policy of their own institution if there is a clear policy, which is not always the case. So, you know, for instance, my own institution thinks that whatever data are produced in the institution are at least to some extent property of the institution. So you can follow this guideline. However, very often research is funded by external bodies. So what happens here? These external bodies and external sponsors also make claims of property over the data, for instance. It's also the case that um, researchers collaborate a lot so they are in very complex networks of collaborators. So what are their responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the institutions of their collaborators? What happens if a funder that funds one of your collaborators and not you requires certain things of your project? How do you deal with that? And then, of course, there's national governments, which are even more complicated, because typically now, especially in Europe, there is a lot of legislation that is coming down from the governmental side about how to deal with open science. And this is also very often in contrast or at least in tension with some of the other guidelines that you get from other uh, institutions or networks you're part of. Can you give an example of that? Something that is in contrast? Yeah, so for instance, um, France has very recently decided to uh, in introduce a new national legislation that favors open access. And in fact, um, they've legalized the publication of preprints. They basically, the legislation states that if research is, well, broadly, of course, I don't want to be liable for this, but my interpretation of it is that um, if you publish work, if you produce papers um, with public funding, then by law, you're basically obliged to make at least a preprint of these papers available online free of charge. The interesting thing about this legislation is that it goes directly against some of the embargo policies of publishers, or at least some publishers, which actually state that if you publish with them, you're not allowed to put your work online, and certainly not for the first, say, six or 12 months after publication in their journals. So this is an example of a situation where things are really unclear. And, and this actually was very deliberate on the side of the French state. They're just trying to push the idea and push publishers into admitting the fact that it's important to have work published open access. 
But uh, at the moment, that means that a lot of people are caught in between. It's really not clear to them what to do. For data, very similarly, I mean, one case I also didn't mention before, but it's also problematic is what happens when you do work which is at least partially sponsored by private uh, money. So you do work which is a public-private partnership in collaboration with an industry. Very often, those kinds of collaborations um, dictate terms of data closure to researchers. So, you know, if you produce data in the context of a project with Shell or with a pharmaceutical company or Monsanto, very often there are requirements from these companies that you don't disclose your data publicly for at least a few months after you have actually produced them. And this is because that, that is for them a way to preserve competitive advantage. So they give you the funding and, you know, as a kind of, a, in return, they get the opportunity to use the data before anybody else. Now, these kinds of policies are in direct conflict with the policies of the European Commission now, which recommends that data are released as soon as possible after they're generated in the lab. So if somebody in their own research group is funded both by a body like the European Research Council and by a private company, and there's many, many people who are exactly in that position, what are they to do? Right? I mean, there's a lot of confusion around this, and rightly so. I mean, it's, it's really not clear what to do in these cases yet. In your surveys, did you observe differences in how these policies are currently being perceived, received by different scientific communities across the world, for example, Europe versus North America? Are they unanimous or there are maybe cultural differences also at play? It is, of course, difficult to generalize. I mean, these are big nations and, and there are big disciplinary differences also. But um, I would say that a lot of the response to the idea of open science depends on how much access to infrastructures and how much expertise in these matters and how much exposure researchers have. What do you mean by infrastructure? Just a, the platform for sharing? So in the case of um, you know, different kinds of research in Europe, for instance, in, in different European nations, even within that, there are huge disparities in the kind of environment that researchers are in when they're conducting the research. I mean, there are institutions which are more peripheral, don't have that much money to invest in a very fast broadband. Maybe they don't have the latest version of software for their computers. You know, their apparatus maybe is a little bit more old-fashioned because they're not, they don't have the money to renew it every year. There are other institutions, particularly in centers of excellence, like in Oxford or in Cambridge or in Sorbonne or so, um, where researchers tend to have much better access to the latest technology, the latest software, etc. Now, the problem sometimes, and that's something I've discussed a lot in my research, is that um, the institutions that end up leading the way in open science, and particularly in setting up the infrastructures for open science, like databases and things like that, are actually the most prominent and best funded institutions. Partly because of this problem of incentives, that they are the ones who actually have some surplus, some spare time and some spare capability that they can devote towards open science activities. Now, the problem, however, is that means that a lot of open science infrastructures, like databases, are set up with the needs of these very well-served uh, researchers in mind. They're not necessarily well adapted to situations where people don't have maybe access to a very fast broadband, don't have access to the latest version of software, don't have access to the latest experimental tools. And, and this actually is creating a lot of problems and disparities in the uptake of open science because all of a sudden we get a situation where actually the richer you are and the better equipment you are, the more you can be open while people who actually have less opportunities in that sense feel that they cannot be quite as open because they don't have the resources, they don't have um, the technology, and they don't have the time. So it's, it's a difficult situation because it's creating a vicious circle where, you know, something that is supposed, really, open science is supposed to help you to level out the disparities in equipment and in opportunities across researchers around the world. And in fact, that's not what we're seeing now. We're seeing quite the opposite, a situation where it's actually making some of these disparities even more noticeable. <laughs> 
There is something that I like about your approach very much, and that is that you keep the picture very real. You don't just promote open science like a concept and like a good thing, which it is, but you you make it real in that you talk about the problems, the obstacles that research groups and individual researchers encounter when they want to open up their data and make their research more transparent and reach a wider audience because it's not about the data, it's about the people. It's about the people who produce the knowledge and who use the knowledge and then benefit from it. And I like this approach very much. You have conducted another study that talks about the importance of turning a research project into a community or to build a community around the research project. And that has to do also with data sharing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, I think one of the interesting questions, also for me philosophically, that comes out of looking at open science, particularly in relation to data, and this whole idea about big data, is the fact that um, one of the reasons why it's so difficult to implement open science is the science now is very, very highly distributed. So you have so many different communities, so many different groups, so many different types of work in science. And that means that when you um, release results in this kind of open way, it's very difficult to predict where they're going to end up. Like, I mean, there can be lots of different outtakes from different people. And that, on one end, makes a lot of people, certainly in philosophy, very nervous, because the question becomes, well, I mean, how do you check that people understand the data properly, that the quality of the data is assessed? You know, are are we building a house of cards here? I mean, what, what is actually going on, right? But at the same time, I think it's also very interesting, this idea of trying to get your head around this unavoidable distributed nature of scientific work. I mean, we are in a moment where science has become so complex. I mean, there's so many different things to to think about when you're doing a scientific project that it's just impossible for one person to to control them all. So we are anyhow shifting, I think, more and more towards recognizing that Thinking about science as a social activity, an activity where even your own understanding is distributed across lots of different minds, it can never be all in your head, but it's just distributed across a team, is fundamental. And so uh, work, as in philosophy of science and in other fields, sociology of science, which tries to understand how scientific communities are composed, what brings them together, how do do people communicate with each other, and between groups, I think it's very important, particularly now, because otherwise we don't really understand what it is that we're calling science at this point and how can we even think about um, disseminating all of these different things across huge fields where different individuals may just do very, very different things with them. I like the idea of science as a social activity very much. And it doesn't come without ethical implications. Are there ethical implications in opening up your data and open science in general? Is it just about personal details like your gender, religion and those things or there are others? Well, I mean, that's certainly the type of data that is talked about a lot these days as having uh, lots of ethical connotations. And I actually believe the problem is much larger and I'm particularly concerned by data which I've in fact, no obvious association to particular individuals like climate data, for instance, or data about temperature in a particular location, but may end up affect communities in particular locations. For instance, in studies which I'm involved in now, which are studies that are trying to bring together data about the temperature, the climate, uh, the vegetation, of a particular area with medical data about, you know, the symptoms that people feel in that area, the epidemics that they um, go through, these kinds of things. And I mean, when you're um, bringing all these different data together in this way, one of the things that people are trying to produce are predictive models that tell you, okay, so for instance, people in this little village, you know, in Belgium, they have a likelihood of having a heart attack which is lower than the national average, or their likelihood of being exposed to asthma is higher than the national average. Once you start to make these predictions, what you're really doing is having, like, potentially affecting very severely 
um, the livelihoods of people who live in that particular village. Because, for instance, the government can come and say, okay, so if people here are more likely to have a heart attack or less likely to have a heart attack and more likely to have asthma, we're going to go to the local hospital and we're going to have much less people there who can take care of cardiology and many more who can take care of respiratory diseases. Right? So I think there are implications around how one deals with data, which data is being linked <laughs> with each other and um, what kind of uh, conclusions we draw out of the analysis of this data, which go well beyond just worrying about privacy. They're really about what kind of knowledge do we think is worth producing, but also what kind of knowledge do we think is best suited to human flourishing, to, to you know, the well-being of people. And that means that um, ethical considerations around you know, social implications of knowledge production really permeate every aspect of knowledge production, in my view. I mean, they're not something that should be assessed by an expert in ethics at the beginning of a project and then never talked about again. It's something that researchers probably really need to think about as they're developing their projects, particularly when they're dealing with these big data conglomerates, which can you know, give you lots of materials to, to reach all sorts of conclusions about society. A discussion around open science is definitely interesting, worth having, and I'm sure we will keep discussing it. To try to bring this episode of Technoculture home, I would like to ask you, having said all we have said, do you have an advice for young researchers who actually want to make a difference, want to open up their data, and they really want to do something about it, but they're not sure how to act because they have different sorts of constraints, uh, work in different situations and research groups. What is it that all of us can easily do? Is there something, an action we can take to start contributing to open science? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, there's lots of things that one can do, I think, that are not too time consuming, but they're definitely going in the right direction. So um, one of the sort of in, in between uh, measures that many people take these days is to actually publish their data separately from publishing papers out of the data. Like in an annex? Actually in things like uh, um, uh, journals. So there are data journals that only publish data sets, but also there are repositories where you can go and you get a DOI, so a digital object identifier for your data set. And I think publishing in those fora actually adds a lot of visibility to your work, particularly when you're a young researcher. So a lot of people are very afraid that if they make their data public at that stage of their work, they may be scooped, other people may come in and steal their ideas. And, um, but actually, there's very little evidence that that's the case. And there's much more evidence that people who do open up at least some parts of their research components early on are actually acquire more visibility in the field. And other, you know, their peers become more aware of their work, and their work gets reused more. So I think you know, people have to be very aware of that, of the fact that behaving in an open science way can be extremely beneficial to your career later on even at the moment when people don't immediately recognize the importance of these behaviors. I mean, it's also been actually increasingly recognized anyhow. But even without that, there are beneficial effects on your career, which are, which are really good. So, you know, a place, for instance, a very good place now to go and put your data is uh, um, Zenodo, which is this big kind of uh, data repository, which is run by the CERN. And there you can deposit your data for free. You get a DOI. So people can share your data, but at the same time they're yours, they need to acknowledge you when they're using your data set if they decide to reuse it. You may get very useful feedback on your research when you put out your results like that. And all of this may help you both to publish eventually, you know, actual papers on, on, on your work, but also to make your name and, and to add to your reputation in the field. So there are all sorts of behaviors like this. And of course, open access of publications, I think by now is a no-brainer. There start to be, in every discipline, options for very good journals, which are very recognized for publishing good work, which are open access. And I would really recommend to any young researchers, do everything you can to publish in an open access journal for the simple reason that these, uh, these uh, papers are much more widely read and more widely cited than papers which are published in proprietary journals. And that really has been demonstrated by lots of empirical studies 
So there are serious immediate advantages to behaving like this. Thank you so much, Sabina, for your time, for sharing your perspective and expertise on open science and also for the advice you just gave on how we can take action. I hope you had a good time in Ghent and that you had a nice trip back home to the UK. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast.